In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-696-1030. Again, 800-696-1030. That's 800-696-1030. 800-696-1030. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. A Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services. Nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 
$3 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment. Reduce your payments by 30 to 50% and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. Get ready to fight from within. You're about to go behind enemy lines. Roger, V2. Goliath copies all. Go ahead. Target is surrounded by multiple firms uh, entering what appears to be a residential area. Uh, requesting permission to engage you. From the People's Republic of New York City, you're now going behind enemy lines with Gene Baradelli and Russ Gallo. You are now behind enemy lines. Hey there, how you doing, America? Gene Baradelli here with you on a beautiful late summer fall evening here in the People's Republic of New York. Russ Gallo in the house. Russ, how you doing, my brother? Yo, what up? Man, we got so much to talk about. Some big guests, some big news. It's just nuts right now, pal. Uh, joining us tonight on the show, Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin uh, from our Value Voters Summit trip. Uh, we talk about Bourbon Month in uh, the United States. I didn't know there was such a month. Oh, yeah, absolutely there is. Well, every month here is Bourbon Month, but whatever. We also talked to uh, Congressman Dave Bratt from Virginia, actually talking some policy for once, Russ. And the main question we talk about, why isn't the Republican Congress passing a budget? Isn't that what we always talked about, the Democrats, when they were in control? Some budget talk, some wonkiness, talking maybe a little bit of Trump with both of them as well. And then, of course, there's me and you talking about what we talk about all the time, which is the liberal lunacy that is out there, especially now in the context of this bombing that happened here in New York City and uh, the, the craziness of, an, of another police shooting involving an unarmed black person. I'd like and, to point uh, out, Gene, how irresponsible you are for calling that a we bombing go. before it was actually here confirmed. Here we go. Here we go. That's irresponsible of you. I'm in trouble again. It happens. You have to wait. Until God himself says it's a bombing before you have the audacity to say something like well, that. Well, go tell it on the mountain. It happened in my city. I'll say what it was, all right? You and That's Donald that. Trump, two maniacs. Just because the mayor says that a pipe bomb and a pressure cooker were intentionally placed to hurt people, you want to call it a bombing. Absolutely. Please don't tell me you're going to call it terrorism next. Oh, it absolutely is terrorism. You see, here's the thing. Before it was a Muslim that was found to have done this. Which again, arrest was made. Still allegations. I By guess. By the way, I was shocked. I don't know about you. I was. I couldn't believe it. I. Uh, I, I really thought it. it was going to be. And I know for sure that uh, you know the libs out there, including Hillary, was just hoping it was some veteran or some crazy white guy or some gun nut. They were hoping. But come on, come on. I know. Pipe bombs, pressure cookers at a marine event uh, on a, a street in a gay neighborhood in Manhattan, which they all are. Um, you know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
Every street in Manhattan's gay? Is that what you're saying there? <laughs> what were you saying? What was that? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite catch that I'm one. I'm not a big Manhattan fan. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> oh boy. It's going to be that kind of night, folks. I can feel it already. Well, listen, I want to thank everybody for listening to the show. We're at www.behindmelinesradio.us. Click, check, click on the, uh, I'm, I'm getting tongue tied. Check on the listen live button and, uh, you can listen to the show. Or go right to speaker.com where we broadcast live and you can check it out there as well. Uh, this shoot, this, sh- I almost said shooting, the bombing. Let's, we got a shooting and a bombing. Let's deal with the bombing first. And yes, I'm going to call it a bombing, damn it, because that's what it is. All right? We're not going to dance around this up. It was a pressure cooker bomb. One of, ma- one of a few, I believe. I believe the guy tried to lay ten different bombs, and only two of them went off, or one of them went yeah, off, or something like that. That's a few pressure cooker so, bombs. So you know, he, he's friends. he's at the Mendoza line of pressure cooker bombs. Yeah. If you know baseball, folks, uh, it's uh. So Gene, wow. let me ask you this question. Say is, wow. Let's start off with a question. A question. Go for it. If I had a bowl of Skittles and I told you just three would kill you, would you take a handful? No, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. But, but let, let's get down to it. A bomb was placed in a dumpster outside of a, a, some facility for the blind in Chelsea, and it exploded. And the first reaction from Mayor Warren Wilhelm... Oh, wait. For those of you not from the People's Republic of New York, that's Bill de Blasio. The first big announcement from him was there was an explosion. We don't know if it was terrorism, but we know that it was some sort of device... So, wait a minute. But more importantly, he said, but we know it was intentional. An intentional bombing. No, he, no, he wouldn't say bombing. An intentional explosion. An intentional uh, device Inten- that exploded. An intentional boom boom. Yes. Is what it was. But it's not terror. It's not terrorism. We're not going to no, jump to that uh, conclusion. We have no evidence that it's, it's terrorism related. No, not for nothing. Terrorism does not mean international terror or Muslim terror. Terror means something that was... Meant to harm people for a political message. I'm pretty sure if you put a pipe bomb on a street or a press truck on a street, it's meant to instill terror in people. That's terrorism. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, I know President Obama doesn't think so because he hung out with the Weather Underground and these guys that were bombing buildings back in the day. And, you know, he doesn't like to call the. Isn't that hypocritical, by the way? That he doesn't think that Bill Ayers and these Weather Underground people who were bombing buildings back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Were terrorists. Why? Because they weren't Muslim? Is that why they weren't terrorists? Well, oh, isn't he Muslim? Oh, wait, we're not going to go there. We're not supposed to go there anymore, are we? Listen. You and Donald Trump. I bottom think. line being that this quote unquote bombing is, you know, we're going to, we're going to go there and call it that. It's clearly terrorism even before they said it was terrorism. You know, what, that's what it is. What I don't get is this. If only we had lawmakers that would just make Bombs and IEDs and pressure cooker devices illegal, then we would be safe. Oh wait, I think those are illegal. <laughs> I think they are. If only you know, listen, they would ban them. We need to ban pressure cookers. Ban in this country. assault bombs, please. Someone, can we do that? Can we pass legislation to ban assault bombs? We need to. No, no. How about we just pass legislation to stop the rampant prolif- proliferation of pressure cookers? Now, Gene, were you That's watching what need to the do. news the night it was going on? I was not. I was doing what any good New Yorker was doing, getting drunk in a bar somewhere. <laughs> well, I was watching the news, and it was great. Okay, t- give me a little sample. So give me a little sample. Fox please. News was convinced that it was uh, garbage from a construction site, so I pretty much changed the channel right away, because they, they were going on for about 45 minutes about that. CNN was focused like a laser beam on the fact that Donald Trump opened up a speech by saying, hey, a couple of bombs just went off in New York City. And they were blasting him for using the term bomb before it was confirmed by anyone else. How dare he? Now, meanwhile, Gene, during that bashing of Donald Trump, if you looked at the scroll underneath, I forgot what that's called on the news. Oh, really? That's what they call it? Scroll. Whatever it is. You know, those words that... I thought a scroll was like the thing that's like, par- like on papyrus and you roll it up and that's... A- oh, yeah, you okay. would. So the scroll on the bottom Thanks. of the news feed while, the- while CNN is bashing Donald Trump for saying it was a bomb before he had any confirmation was saying a bomb went off in New York City. And then Hillary Clinton came on and said a bomb went off in New York City. Oh, and by the way, Donald Trump should not have said a bomb went off in New York City before he had confirmation. Now, you this can't make this thing. up. You can't make this up. Mind you, that both political candidates, Hillary Clinton, once she got woken up, I'm sure she got the same briefing Donald Trump did, they get briefings from the NSA and the FBI and the Secret Service of of 
national security events. And they're supposed to get the same briefing, they right? They get the same briefing. Uh, Hillary looked like she just woke up from a coma when she came to speak to the press um, on her plane. But Donald Trump called a spade a spade, and he said a bomb went off in New York City. And we got to get tough with these people. And Hillary, instead of saying we got to get tough with these people, bashed Donald Trump. So there, there's your two choices this, this November. And hopefully uh, at the debate, that's going to be your two choices. You're going to see Donald Trump being tough on terror, and you're going to see Hillary Clinton bashing Donald Trump, and then you can make your own decision. If we lose this election, Gene, we're done. Oh, we're, uh, the country's done. Absolutely right. We have to endure another four years of denial and hand wringing and equivocation, and you know this touchy feely policy of not wanting to offend a group. Listen, uh, you know, not to tie. Let's tie this into the other news story we're talking about. You know, a police officer shoots someone, most likely by mistake or some error or some breach in protocol, but all police officers are blamed for that. Well, but a, a Muslim blows up New York City intentionally, and we can't say anything bad about Muslims. What th- th- that is the lunacy of what we're dealing with right now. Well, I, got, I mean, I got one better. I kind of joked around about it at the beginning, but I do want to get a little deeper into this. So Donald Trump Jr. sends out a tweet. And he basically said, you know, in reference to the Syrian refugees. So we got tens of thousands of these people floating around the United States. And by the way, that the stabbing terrorist out in uh, Minnesota Mall was a Somali refugee of Muslim uh, faith. The Muslim faith. All right, and we have tens of thousands of them floating around. So Donald Trump Jr. sent out a tweet. And he wrote, "If I had a bowl of Skittles and I told you just three would kill you." Would you take a handful of them? That's our Syrian refugee. Oh wait, problem. that wasn't your your thought. That was that was taken from from Simply Trump's brilliant. Son? It was an analogy, and it was great, spot on. And for the past few days, the press has been doing nothing but bashing Donald Trump Jr. And what does Wrigley say? The the uh, owner, the parent company of, of Skittles. So Wrigley co- puts out a statement that says, "Skittles are candy, refugees are people." We don't feel it's an appropriate analogy. Well, what the hell is an analogy? An analogy is a comparison between two things. I mean, that's the, by definition what an analogy is. Absolutely nuts. I, poor, uh, so Skittles actually had to put out a press release saying we don't like that analogy. Come on, are you I mean, kidding me? This is the lunacy of, of, of the political season like you often say. Facilities. And this is why Donald Trump, is, his message of going against this political correctness era has been resonating so much. Are you kidding me, Skittles? First of all, I thought that was a, a Gallowism. It wasn't a Trumpism. I'm glad to see the two are kind of merging together. So, you Listen, know, I can't, I wish, distingu- I I actually, can't distinguish one from the other. I actually wish his son was running for office because that was pretty, a pretty badass spot-on quote. Well, he's a Democrat, so I don't know if I want that necessarily. Change Donald, on over and Donald we'll do that. Trump was a Democrat not too long ago himself. But uh, you know what? I, to me, it's it's pretty simple. Before we get to your next topic, Go ahead, I no. want to get your opinion on something else related to Donald Trump. All of a sudden, Gallo thinks he's running the show. Okay, yeah. What do you think of uh, George uh, One Foot in the Grave Bush basically saying he's going to vote for Hillary Clinton this time around? Well, I think we all know the closeness between the Bushes and the Clintons. They, they're, they're buddies, they're friends, they're pals. Which for is kind of shocking. Now. I mean, that makes you start believing in conspiracy theories. Didn't George Bush lose to Bill Clinton in a pretty dirty election back then? And didn't his son then take over after Clinton was finished? And uh, listen, I, it's that fraternity of presidents that I just don't get. And how, hasn't Hillary been calling his son a liar for the past, uh, you know, ten years or longer? Pretty, pretty much. Saying we went to war over a lie. And this guy has the nerve to say he's going to vote for Hillary Clinton. What what's going on in our party? Uh, there's a definite split in the party. Or I mean, we, party, we could talk about we talk about Reince Priebus saying that there'll be consequences for those who do not support Donald Trump. I don't know what consequences you can give to a former president of the United States who is not going to be doing any politicking. He's kind of immune to any sort of reprisal. Uh, I don't get isn't. it. His son Jeb, uh, oh, Ted Cruz. And, uh, you know, Kasich, they They're haven't endorsed him yet. Trump is going to lose. They're hedging their bets that Trump will lose and that they all have some political life on the other end Well, of let's, let's imagine now back four years ago with Mitt Romney, if this would have happened with Romney, if people would have been hedging their bets, how would they have been treated? You're absolutely right. You know, I mean, how many times were we told, we're not exactly establishment guys, Russ, though we've played with the establishment in, in New York City. 
uh, and try to get people elected. And we see how that's worked out. Thanks a lot, New York GOP. But, what, you know, we've been told go along to get along, fall in line and all that stuff. Why is it do as I say and not as I do this time around? Because they're not in the driver's seat? Because we're trying something different this time around? Because the electorate actually took control this time around? What is it? Donald Trump is a creation of the, the modern Republican Party. They suck, and this is what you get when you suck. You get somebody totally unorthodox. You guys can't live with them. That makes people like me like them even more. And this is what you get. What's Paul Ro- I ask you again. I, we have an alert, actually. out. We have an APB out for Mitch McConnell. Yes, Is he we do. still alive? I don't know. We haven't gotten a response since the last time I put the APB out, I, so we don't know. I, please, if you're listening to this show... Google Mitch McConnell. Find out if he's still alive. We have not heard anything from him in months now. Please tell me the, the leader of the Senate is alive. You know, that, that's a question I should have asked Matt Bevin during our interview that we're going to be playing in a little bit here. But I, it, you know what? Slipped my mind. Didn't think of it. Darn it. That would have been a good question. Mitch McConnell slipped your mind? Uh, that's just yeah, shocking. shocking, isn't it? But you can say the same thing about Paul Ryan to some extent. Uh, Paul, you know? Paul who? And that's what we talk about with Dave Bratt is why isn't this Congress doing their job in passing a budget? Among other topics... And we see how the interplay between legislating and election politics goes in, comes together. A uh, great discussion with him, which we'll play in a little bit. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's play it now. We're going to go to break. When we come back, our interviews with Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin, our interview with Virginia Congressman Dave Bratt, and then Russ and I get into this Tulsa, Oklahoma shooting and some inconvenient truths about policing when it comes to black and white suspects that I think you guys are going to enjoy. Gene and Russ, Behind Enemy Lines, will be back right after these brief words. If you're a long-time listener of the show, or maybe this is your first time listening, you can probably tell that me and the gang here, we like to have our share of fun, whether it's on or off the air. We talk about two-drink minimum radio and no medication Wednesdays or whatever day it may be. That's why when we found the people at Less Government More Fun, we knew it was a match made in heaven with this show. Folks, we live in a time where government is out of hand. Our founding fathers did not intend government to be all-consuming in all parts of our lives. That's why we are telling you to go to lessgovmorefun.com, check out the website, check out the swag. What the people want is less government, more fun. Pass it on, make it happen. Who might you save? Your mother, your father, your husband, uncle, aunt, son. Learn fast. F-A-S-T. The sudden signs of a stroke and you could save. Your friend, teacher, boss. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. F-A-S-T. That's F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. The sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in the recovery of... Your neighbor, the waiter, grandmother, grandfather. So learn F-A-S-T, the sudden signs of a stroke. Then pass it on, because you never know who might save you. Your wife, your colleague... Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. Behind Enemy Lines Radio is all about being right. No, seriously, it is. Uh, If you ever listen to Russ Gallo or me go back and forth on some issue, we always want to make sure that we remember who said what and when we said it. That's why we go to GoOnRecord.com. It's a brand new social media website. Challenge people on what they believe, whether it's in politics, sports, entertainment, finance, whatever. There's a category for you at GoOnRecord.com. Check it out right now. Tell us, what do you stand for? It's time for you to go on record. Behind Enemy Lines. Back on the air. Gene Baradelli with Red Nation Rising Radio here at the Value Voters Summit. Have the pleasure of speaking with Governor Matt Bivin. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome, Gene. Good to be with you. Well, congratulations as well on the uh, statesmanship award that you got from uh, the D. James Kennedy uh, Foundation. It's a... Great honor. It, it really is a great honor. It's a great honor at several levels. I mean, not the least of which is to be recognized as a Christian, but also as a statesman. It's a double honor that I'm not sure I deserve, but I was grateful to receive. Well, we got Vito and Vito coming in here, uh, joining us from the Vito and Vito show, in case you didn't catch the name there. Uh, a couple of guys from Brooklyn hanging out with a, a governor, and we have no bourbon. What's going on here? 
I, I don't know, Governor. It's it's. I heard September actually, is a big is it, month is it for bourbon. bourbon it's, month? It, it, there is this. There's a lot of celebrations of this. Is not only officially Bourbon Month in Kentucky, but there are many celebrations of it as well. Although, frankly, every month is Bourbon Month in Kentucky, <laughs> and, and in our household as well. So, so listen. Uh, I caught some of your Twitter earlier, and a lot of the great lines that in your speech today. Tell people who weren't at the conference about things that uh, you want them to know about value voters and the importance of being socially conservative, especially with this election cycle. I'm telling people, don't I mean, be socially conservative if, in fact, you are. Don't fake it. Uh, if you're not, it's never too late to do the right thing. I, uh, I would encourage you to be informed. The more informed people are, the more conservative they tend to become. But I would encourage those who are conservative to be bold, to be unapologetic. I just was interviewing with someone else, and I, this is the greatest thing for young guys, too. Vito and Vito, I'll tell you, and, and those of your listeners, I mean, be bold. Stop apologizing for the greatness of America. Stop apologizing for the things that we believe. Stop allowing ourselves to be intimidated and believe that we're the only ones not allowed to have an opinion for fear of being you know, misdirected or, or, or being a, a phobe or a, whatever. But you talk about not being afraid to stand in what you believe in. Donald Trump. I'm voting for him enthusiastically. Do you think that's right, a guy? Calm down a little bit. Do you, <laughs> calm down a little bit. <laughs> Do you think that's a guy who stands up for what he believes in? Because there's a lot of contention on this issue. I did, here's the here's the reality. He's never been in political office, so everybody, it's easy to take shots and go. We don't know if he's going to do this or that. Here's what I would tell people. This idea that we're looking for the perfect candidate, it doesn't exist, folks. It doesn't. Stop holding out for somebody perfect. Who, there is no perfect person. There never has been. There never will be. And if people want to fall on their little sword on principle in some remote corner of the battlefield, what have you done? You've done nothing to affect the outcome of the war which goes on. But without your ability to have any involvement, there are the battles and there is the war. The war continues. The left is not giving up. We have to sometimes concede certain battles, make accommodations in the middle of the battle, forego certain battles, whatever the case might be, but the war goes on, stay engaged. The idea that you're going to sit this one out, sit on your hands because you don't have the perfect candidate or the one you wanted is an insane idea because you are affecting the outcome significantly. There is a cost and an opportunity cost to everything. And the opportunity cost of not being engaged is to get someone like Hillary Clinton elected in heaven help. America and each of our respective families and our children and grandchildren, if we allow that kind of liberal, lawless, godless type of thinking to take control of America. Talking about the split within the party, the left likes to put us all in little boxes, libertarians, social conservatives, middle of the road, whatever have you. Being here at Value Voters, why aren't more libertarians engaging with social conservatives? There's so much more in common than, than there are differences there. And you kind of embody that. This is, I, again, I, I'm grateful to be sort of appreciated by people from a number of different approaches. I mean, from the earliest days, a lot of libertarian folks uh, supported me, and I'm grateful for that. It's largely because I believe in the Constitution of the United States. I believe in the greatness of America. I believe in the principles that were that this nation was founded on. But I'll tell you this. The, the, the Kentucky state motto, which is on our flags, is united we stand, divided we fall. We've got to stop being... The, we, we need a vision. It's been said without vision that people will perish. We as conservatives, regardless of our ideology, our ideological stripes, we've got to be united. We've got to have a vision and stop celebrating our division. We celebrate our division, celebrate our common vision and be united because we will fail if we are divided. You know, and just to wrap things up, one of the things we do at Red Nation Rising is we, we always make sure that people are aware of listening. Money and people is what makes politics happen. We want to make sure that people support you in all your endeavors and initiatives, how they can get in touch with the governor's office and uh, to assist you in, in any way possible, either politically or legislatively. There's so many grassroots organizers in, in Kentucky that want to get behind you and get closer to what you're doing. I would encourage people to go to mattbevin.com, M-A-T-T-B-E-V-I-N.com, or look at us on Facebook or Twitter. I mean, you can M-A-T-T-B-E-V-I-N, Matt Bevin, simple, nine letters. Find us there. I'd be grateful. But I'll tell you, get engaged with people locally. Support, support your local candidates at every level. Write them checks, knock doors, make phone calls. What are you waiting for? Get off your duffs and get out there. If you care about this, care now. If you're going to be engaged, be engaged now. If you're going to work, work now because time is of the essence. No time like the present. Thank you so much, sir. If you want to rob a bank or run a red light, then there's something you should do first that'll make it all right. 
You can break any law without any oversight if you change your last name to Clinton. You can lie to the feds or just act like a jerk. Make a crap ton of money without doing any work. Plus, you can sleep with your staff as an added perk if you change your last name to Clinton. The SEC, the FBI, the House of Representatives, they just don't apply. You can have all of your enemies mysteriously die if you change your last name to Clinton. Sell special favors to the communist Chinese. Charge a hundred million for some speaking fees. Tell that sexy intern to get down on her knees. You can do it if your last name is Clinton. Collect lots of cash through your private foundation. Store top secret info in an unsecure location. And somehow secure the Democratic nomination. You can do it if your last name is Clinton. Nothing to it if your last name is Clinton. Oh, it's against the law? Screw it. Your last name is Clinton. Behind Enemy Lines. Gene Baradelli, Behind Enemy Lines. Pleasure to have on the line with me, returning to the show, Congressman Dave Brack. Congressman, Congressman, thanks for coming on. I'm a little tongue-tied because uh, we had a little trouble connecting, but I'm glad we did. Hey, Gene, thanks for having me on again. So listen, the one thing I love when we get together and we, we discuss things is that it's always a substantive conversation, and it's so different than what the media puts out there, especially during the uh, kangaroo court that is the election season, right? Yeah, right, right. So let's get yeah. right. Let's get let's get into uh, some 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 real talk that people need to know about. I know that you you have a background in economics and and business. So one thing that's been undercovered that I'm sure you have expertise on is uh, the way that our budget has been handled this fiscal year. Let's get into that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm glad you asked. I, and I, I've got a book out called American Underdog, if you want a longer uh, story. That just came out a month ago. But basically, we've had the same thing, right? Republicans won a huge uh, groundswell back in 2010. And since 2010, we've never passed a budget, and we're two out of 72 for appropriations bills, right? So we failed the 70 out of 72 appropriations bills. And so... That's important, but even more important is, uh, are these budgets good or bad for the country, right? And you never hear that from the press, because up here when you're told to compromise and unify and all that, it, it, the press is loaded with the uh, far-left liberal types, and they want more government funding for everything under the sun. Well, the economy is growing at 1%, right? We've been doing the Obama growth project with infrastructure spending and all this kind of stuff. And we're adding to the debt. This year, the deficit is $620 billion, and that's under Republican leadership, right? So my own side is to, is to blame for some of this, and we can do better. And so the House Freedom Caucus, I'm a member, it's 40 of us, and we fought very hard. Leadership came in and promised us regular order, which means we're going to do a budget, and then we're going to have a vote on the House floor so the American people can discipline us, right, and they can approve or disapprove. And we lost that promise, right? Leadership never came through. We never had a vote on the budget. <clears throat> and so now this week, we're down to the shutdown language again, right? Obama and Harry Reid are in the minority, and they're telling us we got three weeks to do a budget, <clears throat> or you're causing a shutdown, and by the way, you're going to lose all your conservative riders, and we probably want to bust the budget caps again. And this is coming about because we did not hold our ground. And uh, so... It, at the end of the day, probably December 11, right, you can see if I'm right or not, we probably end up with an omnibus again, even though we're talking about doing these mini buses in a CR right now, short-term CR. Uh, I don't think that's what's going to come about in the end. And so there's a two-minute overview, but uh, whatever you or your callers are interested in, fire away. Yeah, well, the one thing that I think they would be first interested in is the first point you brought up, and that is... Republicans are fearful of their electorate for not keeping the promises that were made in 2010 and 2014 of reigning in out-of-control government. It seems like, from what you're saying, that they're more part of the problem than they are part of the solution. Yeah, well, and, and I don't want to go that far on my own guys, but we got too many of them, right? There, there's something wrong, because we got 80% 
uh, in the presidential voting for outsiders, right? Like Trump and Carson and, and Cruz and Rand Paul and Walker. It's 50 percent on the Democrat side. But then the American people are a little schizophrenic and they just returned all the incumbents in Congress back. <clears throat> and how's the country doing, right? How are we doing on foreign policy, the military, the budget, economic growth? Not so hot. And so, you know, the people got to take a better look under the hood and see what we're all voting on and make sure, you know, if, if you got people that are busting the budget and not doing pro-growth stuff, uh, don't send them back here. And so some of the Republicans are good. Some of them uh, are voting for budget busters, but the Democrats, on the other hand, are unanimously, right? They'll never bring up the debt. You, if you think of it, has Hillary Clinton ever brought up $19 trillion in debt? Oh. $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities, right? Medicare and Social Security, these things are $100 trillion unfunded, and they're both insolvent by about 2034, and not a, not a blip out of the Democrats. Well, so, you can't uh, win on that, right? Too scared of the voters. You, you can't win on that, on saying that. You can't win on, on speaking truth of what the actual state of the economy is. You can only do it, win by blaming the other guy, right? So it's, yeah. is yeah. it, is it the fact that the, because this is a presidential election year that we're not going to hear anything from either side? Is, is that what's driving this? Because winning is more important yeah. than, than, than success? Yep. Yep. And it's presidential, even in the non-presidential, right? After the, Mitt Romney loss. We had that Republican autopsy report. And they got it all wrong, right? We're supposed to be scared of every minority group, African American, Hispanic, women, et cetera, right? I mean, it's just absurd. In my book, you know, Republicans, if we had our head on straight, we're in, we're in favor of the Judeo Christian tradition, the rule of law, free markets, right? African Americans are all my friends. They're all Protestants. Uh, Hispanics are overwhelmingly Catholic. Everyone fits into the same grand tradition that made this country great. And so why we are scared of everybody all of a sudden is just beyond me, right? When you're growing at 1% and the Republican Party, our talking points are great, right? We just we just don't do them enough. And so we need to execute on this pro-growth stuff and, and get the debt down to manageable levels. And then Trump is, is messaging great on uh, school choice going into the inner cities uh, where the kids – they have no probability of success right now, right? These public school systems, we're funding them $12,000 a year per kid for 13 years, and the kids get out, and they don't know what a business is, right? They, they, they The schools are just decimated, and the Democrat machines in those cities won't allow any change whatsoever. If you try to change anything, even the smallest little movement toward choice for the parents or the kids so they'll have successful kids in business, uh, the left just goes bananas. And so uh, that's where we're at. you got a big choice coming up in uh, Trump versus Hillary. And uh, I think Trump's going to win it big, actually. It's, it's, it's going, the wind's going our way. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that you think that. But I'm, I'm more concerned about, you know, when you take this message back to your district. Cause, cause every congressional district is sort of like a microcosm of America, right? You, you need to, when you bring the message back that you're bringing, are voters receptive to the, the kind of proposals that you want to bring? And if so, doesn't that mean that Republicans shouldn't be fearful of bringing back the message that you've been talking about? Well, that's what's tricky. My my district is, is exceptional, right? They sent me up here, right? So my district has James Madison and Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson is right next door. And so I got a great district that pays attention to all these fundamentals, and they're happy with the way I'm voting because I, I promise my principles ahead of time. I got a 100% conservative review, 100% small business score, 100% liberty score, all these kind of things that I, I, I'm holding true, right? But the rest of the country, if you go around to the big you know, metro areas, New York City, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, L.A., I mean, it, it is harder for Republicans to give this message. Uh, but you got to, right? You got to explain to uh, that every small business person right now is getting hammered by federal government intrusion and regulation, right? The franchisee rule, the fiduciary rule, waters of the U.S., the overtime rule. Uh, just since the day I came in, Obama's unconstitutional amnesty, the list just goes on forever. And small business can't, they can't afford Obamacare anymore. And all these groups on the Republican side and our business groups are trying to be bipartisan still 
as the Democrat Party and the far left tries to put them out of business. So it's time for them all to make up their minds, right? They've got to come over to the pro-growth party that favor small business, and, we, and if they do, we'll clean up uh, this November. I think you got the right message to win, and, you know, of course, we're, we're pulling for you to win in, in your race this year. But I also want to touch very quickly upon, you know, the new book. I, when we spoke last in June, it was coming out, but now it's hit the bookshelves, right, American Underdog? Yeah, yeah, and it, it uh, it's doing well. It's American Underdog proof that principles matter. I go over all the long-term economic stuff. I cover my race uh, where I beat the sitting majority leader and uh, just how I, I spoke the truth. I went out, gave economic lectures, a- ethics lectures. The press just ridiculed me, right? Just made fun of me for giving these boring lectures. Turns out the people love the stuff, right? And then we go back and forth for a half hour Q and A, and that's what politics is supposed to be, where your representative is just talking with the people, and you're talking about the budget and foreign policy and the rule of law. And it's been great, right? So I've had a great ride, and uh, I, tr- I try to explain a lot of these fundamentals in the book, and I and I, 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 I kind of make the argument there's three pillars that made us great, the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, without which you don't get any of the rest of it, right? The rule of law and human rights language comes straight out of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And then you get the rule of law and then free markets, and uh, we don't spend enough time on that, right? We go back to the founding, but it's not. It's 4,000 years of history is at stake. And the far left, by contrast, is just an utter attack, right? If you go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, where these philosophy brown bags, if you bring up religion, you get laughed out of the room. And then the rule of law, Hillary and the left are just ridiculing our police, sheriffs, officers, et cetera. At free markets, I mean, the last thing you ever hear about in D.C. is a free market system, right? It's everything is central government planning. And so I just try to flesh that out in the book. And uh, it's a good book for uh, high school kids, college kids to read. But I try to lay out, you know, I taught for 18 years, so I try to lay out some of the great books that I've got to read over my life. And it's it's not me. It's all the, the heavy hitters in Western Civ. And so go check it out, American Underdog. Yep, available on Amazon and where finer books are sold. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, you bet. And for my, I always send out emails to anyone that wants to join my list. So across the country, just go to DaveBrat.com, B-R-A-T, DaveBrat.com, and I send out emails explaining all my votes and uh, my Facebook's available to see what I'm doing uh, week by week. Absolutely. Listen, every time we get together, I learn something. You know that, that education background comes through, and I really appreciate you coming on the show, sir. Thank you so much. No, oh, thanks for having me on. Anytime. <laughs> Thanks to everybody out there. And that was Virginia Congressman Dave Bratt. We also want to thank uh, Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin for coming on the show. Getting some high-profile guests here, pal. I'm impressed as always, Gene. And once again, Russ wasn't there. But he doesn't let me do interviews. I, I'm not allowed. That is not true. Ever since that one time. Stop spreading that rumor. Uh, man, oh man. You know, listen. I want you to be there for all these things, but... Listen, you got a new job. I'm going to Korea in a couple of weeks. You know, we got we got things happening in our in our lives outside of the show that uh, Korea. Yeah, absolutely. I'm What's going to happen to the show? Well, there's there's a rumor going around that Russ Gallo might be flying solo for the first time ever. What do you think next about that? Next week it might be all Russ. Next week? No, next week I'm here. I mean, whatever week that is. <laughs> listen, I just show up. That's all right, I mean. listen. It's just about halftime on the show here. We want to thank everybody for listening to Behind Enemy Lines Radio. I'm Gene. He's Russ. And while we got you listening, check us out at www.behindenemylinesradio.us. Check us out on the Facebooks and the Twitters at BEL underscore radio. And if you miss any part of the show here, live Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on Spreaker, you can check us out on any one of our rebroadcast outlets, including WJHC 107.5 FM in Jasper, Florida, WDDQ 92.1 FM in Adele, Georgia, both of which are part of the Red Nation Rising Radio Network. Check us out at rednationrising.radio.us, or actually rednationrising.us, I should say. And I'm losing track. I almost, it almost got derailed. KLRN Radio, uh, High Plains Radio, and Sackheads Media, ICRN, the Internet's Conservative Radio Network, and Lanterns Radio. And if you miss us on any one of the rebroadcasts, check us out at any time you want, really. I'm losing it. Through any one of our podcasting networks, which includes iTunes, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, PodBay, Player FM, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, and iHeartRadio. That was rough. 
That was rough. If and when I do this show alone, I probably won't be doing the plugs like... I'll like pre-record you. it for you. Don't worry about it. But it's probably better off anyway, because if I do the show alone, we'll probably lose all those guys anyway. Wow. Or at least a good chunk of them. At least half. I, I'm going to go with <laughs> half. Just half, but because uh, they don't know what good radio is. No, I'm kidding. All of our affiliates know what good radio is, but Rush Gallo is better radio. I'm telling you right now. Listen, we got some debates coming up next week. Next week's show is going to be all about debate analysis, Russ. The debates that Russ Gallo said weren't going to happen, I might add. I still... Uh, so, you know how they do the odds in Vegas and everything? So, I'm still above 50% that the first debate... I disagree. Will it's not on. happen on the day they say it will happen. I disagree. I disagree. It's happening. Hillary's not going to show. Okay, so you're the program director. What, what happens when Hillary doesn't show? What do you do? She, they, they're going to reschedule that first debate, and instead of three, there'll only be one. I can almost guarantee you this. It's not going to happen. I First of all, Gene, this. let me ask you this. This first debate is 90 minutes long. Yeah. The lights are hot. Yeah. There's no, there's nobody to stand there and help her up. There's no stool for her to sit on. But she's done debates before with Sanders. I mean, come on. She's passed out like five times in the last five days. She's not going to be able to do it, Gene. She's a 90-year-old lady with a bladder the size she's of a pea. She's not pee. 90. She's not going to be she's able 70. to go to the bathroom. She's going to be up there for 90 minutes, the hot lights. She passes out. She has a broken hip, a fractured head, a concussion. She can't remember deleting emails. She's not making the debate, Gene. Oh, boy. It's not happening. I think it's happening. I think Donald Trump wins the first debate absolutely, hands down, 100%, especially given the climate. Given uh, the the uh, terror attacks, I know we're not supposed to talk about political opportunism when it comes to an explosion in the People's Republic of New York City, but it's there. It's the it's the 500 pound gorilla, not named Harambe, in the room. You She's know not I mean? Harambe. Yeah. By the way, for those who are listening out there, Harambe was just a gorilla. Okay, that's it. No no greater power. None of that other nonsense that I've been seeing online. Just stop. All right. Anyway, Hillary's not making the debate, Gene. All right. Listen, you're on record. You know, now you gotta go on to, record. Now you gotta go on record at goonrecord.com, one of our great sponsors. Go on record.com. Tell us what you believe in. Dano Sign in the chat room, by the way, he brought up an interesting point, which I was kind of alluding to. Remember when she was debating Bernie Sanders? You know, the, the, I think he has like 20 years on her, so that makes him like 110. I don't remember any of these debates at all. Uh, she went to the bathroom, and then when he came back from commercial, she was gone. Like she was, she wasn't on the stage anymore. Was she really in the bathroom? Who knows? Who knows? Or was she passed okay. out? Okay. Or was she getting an adrenaline shot backstage? Talk about low energy. This woman's on fumes. When that 3 a.m. phone call comes, is she going to be sleeping through it? Or is she going to be on a respirator? Your guess is as good as mine. Or is Tim Kaine going to be making a decision? Who is Tim Kaine? Don't worry. Isn't the first debate with CNN and, uh, uh, what's his name? Anderson Cooper? No, it's not. The first one is with, uh, the, the ABC guy. Oh no! Wait. Okay, we're gonna look that up. If Lester anybody Holtz. Chat, is NBC, he's NBC. And oh, so NBC, so NBC. don't worry about a thing, baby. NBC will take care of her, right? They, listen, they will. Lester Holt. That's why this debate's happening. Honestly, though, Lester Holt is right up there with Chris Wallace as as being sort of fair. He's left of center, but he's sort of fair. I'm gonna remember that you said that. And when we'll we talk see. about it next week, we'll see how fair he actually was. I mean, Anderson Cooper, that's off the charts. I don't even know why Trump would go to that debate. Well, I think he can have fun with CNN and, and pull his normal, you know, routine. But, okay, slightly off topic, but talking about press relationship with Donald Trump, how much do you love that Donald Trump used the press to get to go on a more free advertising for himself when it came to this major announcement he wanted to make, and then he ended up talking about all the endorsements he was getting from military veterans and, uh, you know, Purple Heart winners and all this absolutely brilliant and then the press all got mad because they got duped again because they're dumb the guy is brilliant Um, he plays the media like a fiddle and if you look at the election and the momentum right now the polls let's just go with the polls almost every national poll has Trump up now Uh, real clear politics the, the average of polls shows Trump within a point of Hillary Clinton and more importantly the electoral math is changing as well drastically and and the thing about Real Clear, which most of the media outlets like to cite, uh, since it's an average of polls, is that's usually a lagging indicator because it averages polls. So you have some polls in there from a week or two weeks ago, might still be mixed in there, bringing the average down. But if you look at daily tracking polls, Trump is actually destroying Hillary Clinton right now. And in the battleground states, like you said, yes, he's that's caught what I'm about up to talk about. So all, in every battleground state, he's caught Florida's up. Florida's a toss-up now. 
It went, went from being leaning Democrat to now it's a toss up. Uh, Nevada is now a toss up. You know, I mean, these are states that you typically think of as swing states. And if they're back in play, that means that Hillary's got some work to do, and who knows if she's in shape to do any work. And, I mean, Fox News is trying so hard not to seem biased that they put up an electoral map earlier today that shows uh, Hillary Clinton had 260 electoral votes. You need 270 to win. So they say Hillary Clinton has 260 in the bank, Donald Trump has 180 in the bank, the rest are all toss-ups. Um, in those toss-ups, they still have Georgia. Like, he, he's he's more than four points ahead of her in Georgia, and if you think somehow Donald Trump is going to lose Georgia, you're out of your mind. And to our listeners in Georgia and on the Florida-Georgia line, be on the lookout for the Red Nation Rising bus traveling everywhere in support of Donald Trump. Uh, thanks to Star Coaches for handling that, and uh, be sure to check it out. Have you seen pictures of this bus, Russ? It's absolutely amazing. i got to show them to you, uh, Lake, because I know you don't have the Facebooks. Uh, but the bus is going is on like a stadium tour, going to different events, college football events, No, you uh, showed NFL me, events. and the Red Rate Nation Rising logo's on there. It's a pretty cool bus. It, it's pretty awesome, and I think that's... It's I actually making an a invite, difference. but all right. Listen, when, when, you are you gonna, when are you heading to Georgia? Yeah. Well, Come on. We, love, we Georgia. love our listeners, and we want to get down there soon, but I don't know between schedules and whatever we're going to make it. I don't know, though... Bill Clinton called everybody in Georgia racist, so yeah, well, you guys are a bunch of racists down there. Hillary using a southern drawl whenever she's down there, too. But I digress. Listen. Oh, and Bill Clinton using Make America Great Again during his campaign. Conveniently forgot that he used to say that. Oh, con- yeah, conveniently forgot. You know, a- absolutely. And we can, we can go into all that. We can go into how Donald Trump wasn't a racist until he started, started running for president. We can go into how Jesse Jackson used to praise Donald Trump for his uh, bringing diversity to Wall Street and all this stuff. But we have to get to some current news, Russ. We promised the people that we would give them a few inconvenient truths about policing when it comes to race relations that is quantifiable, verifiable, and real numbers instead of speculation or, you know, illusory statements that come from, you know, politically motivated progressives. Or as I like to say, dumb stuff liberals say. Can I preface this this uh, conversation about that? Absolutely. Listen, listen. You're the law enforcement guy, and you our you are our uh, director of race relations here on the show. So. And I've been shot by the cop. Now I'm looking. <laughs> so uh, I've said this several times on this show, and I just want to preface our our conversation with this. First of all, the Democrats, the left, Black Lives Matter, all these people have missed golden opportunities here. The right wing, uh, you know, the the right of center, Republican Party, and Libertarians of the country agree with them on some aspects of this argument of over-policing, the militarization of police forces, uh, the losing of our civil liberties. They agree, but the way the left goes about it is all wrong. So over-policing is one issue. Uh, the shooting of unarmed people, that goes right along with it. Um, that's a tragedy always. Now, do, do a lot of these unarmed people in the news lately... Uh, kind of bring it upon themselves? Absolutely. Fighting with the police? Yeah. Uh, resisting, resisting arrest? arrest? All that stuff. Yes. yes. It's always a tragedy when someone is killed that's unarmed with the police. Tragedy for the police officer, tragedy for the families involved. Absolutely. However. And then I just have this last point and then let's go into go the ahead. however. The, the, the greatest unspoken part of this whole argument is that there truly is a war on men in this country. Uh, if you look at the numbers of, forget about race for a second. If you look at the number of men who are behind bars in this country, it is completely disproportionate to the, to the population. Completely. So you have men in jail, mostly young men, whose lives are destroyed in jail right now. There's a war on men. And what is being done to stop this or to curb this? Absolutely nothing. And this is coming from first-hand experience. I mean, you've worked in prisons for years. And you, you see this on a daily basis. So, I mean... Lots of young men whose lives are utterly ruined by a combination of their own idiotic actions, over-policing, and, and just a basic war on men. There is no saving these guys. They're just locking them up. So with this in mind, Russ, let's delve into the real stats and the real numbers as verified by institutions like Harvard and you know a school you went to like John Jay or Washington State University. All these things from learning people. Again, this isn't us saying it, folks. This, 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 these are facts. This is like, you know, this is science, people. This is the real deal about policing in our nation. Russ, hit him with, hit him with fact number one. All right, and this, this is actually, Bill O'Reilly talked about this a few times too. Police are actually more likely to shoot whites than blacks. So there were several studies done. Um, this one mentions John Jay College uh, over here in Manhattan, New York. Oh, Russ Gallo alumni. 
uh, I'm not too proud of that. Oh, okay, then. John Jay is pretty much a garbage school. But ha! Uh, this guy seems like a good enough guy. But he, but he wrote, you know, basically when everything's adjusted, whites are actually 1.7 times more likely than blacks to die at the hands of police. Um, you know, you would never find that fact anywhere else. Uh, Bill O'Reilly cited it a few times and basically was called racist. But I don't really see how you're a racist if you're just citing statistics. Like, I, I don't get it. Statistics should be race neutral, you would think. Here's another one. Police are less likely to shoot unarmed blacks than they are to shoot unarmed whites. According to Washington State University, police officers are three times less likely to fire at an unarmed black man. Again, it's not us saying it. This is a university study. They took some police officers from Spokane and put them through some tests and trials. And as a result of that testing, they found that these particular officers were less likely to shoot at an unarmed black person. Hmm. Possibly, and this is number three, so possibly the biggest tragedy in all of this and and where people like Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson and these guys totally lose all credibility is for every black killed by a white police officer in this country... There are 71 blacks killed by other blacks. Say that one more time so everybody gets that. And a little slower. Please, this is huge. Every single, for every black person killed by a white police officer every year, there are 71 blacks killed by other blacks. There's basically a war in, in the urban areas of this country. And if you don't believe me, look at Chicago, look at Detroit, look at Philadelphia, look at any big urban area that's majority minority. And it's basically a war zone, and you have lots of blacks killing blacks. Now, would it be better for whites killing blacks or blacks killing whites? No. But it's an undeniable truth of what's happening, and it's astonishing that black leaders, so-called, are not addressing this issue. They need, You would think black lives would matter to black lives matter. But I guess political expediency is more important. Here's another fact. This one coming from a 2013 study by the National Institute for Justice. Uh, blacks do get pulled over more than uh, white people because blacks commit a disproportionate amount of traffic offenses. Three out of four black people are pulled over for a legit reason, according to the study, and because they have a higher rate of outstanding warrants, according to the National Highway Safety Administration. So, when you talk about you know racial profiling and racial targeting, it's not so much targeting as it is factual. If there were less offenses in let's say traffic offenses or if there are less warrants outstanding perhaps the reality wouldn't be that 75 percent of these stops are legitimate stops for us yeah but the, the narrative does not face the facts and and when you when you only cite half of a statistic it makes it seem like it's real racist um for instance if i said isn't it kind of unfair that most young men who are arrested for terrorism in our country happen to be muslim uh, are we being racist towards muslim no the majority of terrorist acts c- c- committed in this country are by Muslims. All Number right. five. Number five. Here's another fact. All right. Racial act, and this is big in New York City. So racial activists accuse stop and frisk of being racist. And yet the percentage of black stopped is actually underrepresented when compared to the percentage of blacks that commit crimes. Now, Mayor Bloomberg yes. got bashed. From Mayor Bloomberg, former mayor of New York City, got bashed when he said this. They said, it, you know, um, basically... Uh, let me see if they have. They actually do have the numbers here. Fifty-five uh, percent of all New York City uh, police department stops were uh, were of black people for stop and frisk. Fifty-five percent, but sixty-six percent of violent crimes were committed by blacks. Sixty-six percent of the crimes were committed by blacks, or or blacks were accused of committing those crimes. Fifty-five percent were stopped and frisked. So Mayor Bloomberg said, if anything, they're, they're being stopped and frisked disproportionately lower than they should be. And he also and, and he also said that the reason why the stop and frisks were happening in heavy minority areas because that's where most of the crimes were being reported. And that, that's absolutely nuts. And a, a quick uh, police science lesson in New York City: we have something called crime stat. Which is a very scientific method. CompuStat, yes. CompuStat. So whenever a, a, a crime gets reported and put into a system, it goes into this big database, and that's how they figure out where to deploy more police. High crime areas get more police. Hence, more stop and frisks in those areas. Hence, more contact with white officers and black suspects. And when you resist arrest, you get more confrontation with police. All right, got to get quickly through these things because we're up against the time right now. Uh, another, fact number six. Look, we did our homework for this show, folks. It's not us saying this. This is verifiable information. 
According to Alfred Bloomstein, who, who wrote a book about crime statistics and prison statistics, Russ talked about underrepresentation in stop and frisk. Well, guess what? Blacks are also have an unrepresented number in prison. When you compare the arrest data out there and compare it to the number of black people convicted of homicides, you'll see that the numbers don't match up. The arrest rate is much higher than the, than the incarceration rate is. Again, where is this argument of targeting? If there are these underrepresentation in numbers when you start comparing them, it's just a fiction put together for political expediency. And the last one talks about broken windows theory uh, for you criminal justice majors out there. Broken windows theory basically just says uh, if you arrest for low level crimes, quality of life crimes, uh, you stop the bigger ones from festering in bad neighborhoods. So uh, number seven in our list says by a margin of 50 percent to 46 percent, 50 to 46 percent, black voters actually support broken windows policing and and they also support giving summonses or making arrests in their own neighborhoods for quality of life offenses think about it a, a, a single black mother bringing her kid to school damn sure doesn't want guys smoking weed on the corner while her kid is going to school they want to see their neighborhoods cleaned up by at least 50 to 46 percent it should be higher but it's still a majority what do you take away from all this folks politics and reality hardly meet at any intersection. So when you start hearing the narratives that come out, especially from this uh, Terrence uh, Crutcher unfortunate situation in Tulsa, like we've seen with other stories uh, all over the country, the lesson to learn here is understand the source of the comments and the commentary. And understand that commentary is not facts. Look to facts when you want to deal with these arguments, and that's how you always combat a liberal. Like Russ says all the time, you can you confront a liberal with facts. Next thing you know, you're being told that they need to go to a safe space and and run away, and you know you're offending them and all this other nonsense. Numbers are numbers, facts are facts. Bunch of inconvenient truths, Russ. I'm glad that we actually did this. Feels good to actually I get some fact out there. A little bit until Trip the next to a liberal. Until the next time that we have to be relieved, which you know. Considering we have to end the show soon, I'm calling dibs on the bathroom first. Anyway, <laughs> final thought time, Russ. What do you got for me? I got two, two, Gene. If you if you'll indulge, you're me. gonna take mine. So go right ahead. So no, go ahead. Mine no, no, I'm, 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 it's my pleasure. Number go one, ahead. boycott the NFL, boycott Skittles. That's number one. Colin Kaepernick is making thirteen million dollars this season, and he's not set one foot on the field. So boycott far. the NFL, boycott Skittles. Number two, and there's a quick one. So you'll have some time here, Gene. I heard. Through the grapevine, that Brangelina broke up. Brad Pitt and Angelina. I know. I'm broken up about it myself. I like uh-huh. the sound of uh, Rush Jelena. <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. Angelina, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it, you took my final thought. <laughs> uh, so, listen, somewhere Jennifer Anderson is just saying, I'm just here drinking my tea. <laughs> I'm telling you. All right, final thought time from me. You know what? This has been a great show. I want to thank everybody for coming on. Matt Biven, Governor of Kentucky, uh, Virginia Congressman Dave Bratt, great guests on the show. Uh, it, it's been a whirlwind of a of a show. I'm a little dizzy from it myself, but I guess the final thought for me is, I, I just pretty much said it already. Deal in facts. Don't deal in feelings. Deal in data. Don't deal in safe spaces and emotion and all this other stuff. It, time has come for adults to act, and uh, that's really it. And my real final thought is, I want to know, is Russ Gallo going to buy a Mets jersey now that Tim Tebow has signed with the New York Mets? No, but I will dust off my Denver Broncos Tebow jersey. Oh, boy. And throw that back on. There you go. God bless our first responders and police officers. You guys did a hell of a job in New York City and in New Jersey with this terrorist scum uh, Islamic extremist. Quick that, quick uh, to the scene, and you ran towards danger while everybody else in those liberal-ass neighborhoods was running away. Thank Absolutely. you, and God bless. God bless the NYPD and our tri-state area police and first responders. Russ, that'll about do it for us. Time to shut this sucker down. What do you say, brother? Shut it down. Let's hit the streets and go look for a uh, terrorist. James. Dibs on the bathroom first. Good night, folks. Till next week. We'll see you then. Our position has been compromised. It's time to roll out. Report for debriefing at www.behindenemylinesradio.us and look for regular communications via Facebook and Twitter at BEL underscore radio. You are the resistance behind enemy lines. A Rock Radio Production. Copyright 2016. Back in seven days.
out.